Hey everyone, sorry I couldn't make it to class today. Uh, something came up and I'm just not going to be able to make it. Thankfully, because of technology, uh, we'll be able to make sure we don't get too far behind on our lectures. So, uh, with that being said, we're going to finish our lecture on slavery because we never actually finished that from last time. Um, we were going to move into the French and Indian War. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that today. So what we're going to do is we're going to save that to uh, September 25th is when we'll do the French and Indian War. Uh, the problem is, is you do have a writing assignment that does talk about the French and Indian War. So I'll give you the page numbers for that uh, so you have more of a direct idea of where you're supposed to read to get the information for that. But that will also at least hopefully give you some insight into the French and Indian War uh, before the lecture. So maybe you'll know what I'm talking about. So fingers crossed. Okay, so where we left off, um, let me pull it up to the right slide here, and they changed my background and whatnot on here, uploading it to the site, so we will do what we can. All right, I believe we were here, and I'm going to get myself off the screen. All right, so uh, some of this is just going to be reiterating what I said last time, but I just wanted to make sure that the point was really driven across that although um, we believe often that you know all the people in the South had a whole ton of slaves that wasn't often correct as you can see here 76 percent were actually non-slave holders that doesn't mean necessarily that they were against slavery it just meant that they ne they couldn't necessarily afford it all right so Southern intellectuals worked hard to encourage these ideas of white solidarity and to make the case for slavery. Many of the founders, a whole bunch of them you'll remember, uh, held slaves themselves, saw slavery as a necessary evil. Jefferson once wrote, quote, As it is, we have the wolf by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. So, it's pretty um, common knowledge that Thomas Jefferson had a lot of slaves and he had even had relationships with some of his slaves. You can look up all the information you want later. Uh, and he actually also had offsprings with those slaves. Uh, the belief that justice and self-preservation couldn't sit on the same side of the scale was really opposed to the American idea. And in the end, it would make the Civil War inevitable. But as slavery became more entrenched in these ideas of liberty and political equality were embraced by more people. Some Southerners began to make the case that slavery wasn't just a necessary evil. They argued, for instance, that slaves benefited from slavery because, you know, their masters fed them and clothed them and took care of them in their old age. So, obviously, it was a good thing for them. Doesn't he look like a lovely bloke? So, you still hear that argument today, that slavery was, you know, a good thing. Uh, the paternalism allowed masters to see themselves as benevolent and to con contrast their family-oriented slavery with the cold, mercenary capitalism of the, the North. So, yeah, in the face of rising criticism of slavery, some Southerners began to argue that the institution was actually good for the social order. One of the best-known proponents of the Sioux was G John C. Calhoun, this lovely guy right here. In 1837, uh, he said on a speech on the Senate floor, I hold that in the present state of civilization, where two races of different origin and distinguished by color and other physical differences, as well as intellectual, are brought together, the relation now existing in the slave-holding states between the two is, instead of evil, a good, a positive good. This guy was a little crazy, just letting you know. We justified this insanity with biblical passages and with the examples of the Greeks and Romans and with outright racism, arguing that black people were inherently inferior to whites and that not and that not to keep them in slavery would upset the natural order of things. This uh, actually was a worldview that was popularized millennia ago by Aristotle. So here's the truth about slavery. It was coerced labor that relied heavily on 
dehumanization of people. Slave work conditions and tasks varied, but all slaves labored, usually from sun up to sun down, and almost always without pay. Most slaves worked in agricultural uh, fields, on plantations, and, and con the conditions were varying and different uh, depending on what, uh, what crop that they grew. Like slaves on rice plantations on South Car in South Carolina, they had terrible working conditions, but they labored under the task system which meant that once they completed their allotted daily work, they would have time to do other things. But unless, don't imagine that this was like how we have work and leisure time. Bear in mind that they were owned and treated as property. And this wasn't just a cultural system. It was a legal one. I mean, Louisiana law proclaimed that the slaves, the slave owes his master a respect without bounds and an absolute obedience. You might recognize um, this picture from the um, assignment that we did last week, too. It's not exactly one for it, but they had these in the Virginia Gazette and a, a whole bunch of other places as well. So on cotton plantations, most slaves worked in gangs, uh, usually under the control of an overseer or another slave who was called a driver. This was a back-breaking work done in the southern sun and humidity, and so it's not surprising that whippings or the threat of them were often necessary to get slaves to work. It's easy enough to talk about the brutality of slave discipline, but it can be difficult to internalize it. Like, you look at these pictures, like this one right here, but because you've seen them over and over again, they don't have the power that they might have. The pictures can tell a story about cru cruelty, but they don't necessarily communicate how arbitrary it was. That brutality, the whippings, the brandings, the rape, that was all real and it was intentional. Because in order for slavery to function, slaves had to be dehumanized. This enabled slaveholders to rationalize what they were doing and it was hoped to reduce slaves to the animal property that is implied by the term chattel slavery, which we talked about last time. So the idea was that slaveholders wouldn't think of their slaves as human, and slaves wouldn't think of themselves as human. But of course it didn't really work. Slaves' resistance to their dehumanization took many forms, but the primary way was by forming families. Family was a refugee for slaves and a source of dignity that masters recognized and sought, sought to stifle. The paternalistic slave owner named Bennett H. Barrow wrote his rules for the Highland Plantation, and I quote, No rule that I have stated is of more importance than that relating to Negroes marrying outside of the plantation, it creates a feeling of independence. End quote. Most slaves did marry, of course, and actually usually for life. And when possible, slaves grew up in a two-parent household. Single-parent households were common, though, as a result of one parent being sold. In the Upper South, where the economy was shifting from tobacco to different, less no, labor-intensive uh, cash crops, the sale of slaves was common. Perhaps one-third of slave marriages in states like Virginia were broken up by sale. Religion was also an important part of their uh, life in slavery. While, while masters wanted their slaves to learn the parts of the Bible that talked about being happy in bondage, slave worship tended to focus on the other stories of Exodus, where Moses brought the slaves out of bondage, or biblical heroes who overcame great gods like Daniel and David. And although most slaves were forbidden to learn to read and write, many did anyway. And some became preachers. Slave preachers were often very charismatic leaders, and they roused the suspicion of slave owners, and not without reason. Two of the most important slave uprisings in the South were led by preachers.
So one of the primary ways that slaves resisted their oppression was by running away. Although some slaves escaped for good by running away to northern free states or even to Canada, where they, could, they wouldn't have to worry about fugitive slave laws, even more slaves ran away temporarily, hiding out in the woods or the swamps, and eventually returning. No one knows exactly how many slaves escaped for freedom, but the best estimate is that a thousand or so a year made the journey northward. Most, uh, most fugitive slaves were young men, but the most famous runaway was, of course, Harriet Tubman. This lady right here. Harriet Tubman, uh, she escaped to Philadelphia at the age of 29. And over the course of her life, she made about 20 trips back to Maryland to help friends and relatives make the journey north on the Underground Railroad. But a more dramatic form of resistance to slavery was actual armed rebellion, which was attempted. Now, individuals sometimes took matters into their own hands and beat or even killed their white overseers or masters. But large-scale slave uprisings were relatively rare. Uh, the four most famous ones all took place in a 35-year period at the beginning of the 19th century. Gabriel's Rebellion was in 1800. On August 30th of 1800, uh, Gabriel intended to lead slaves into Richmond, but the rebellion was postponed because of rain. So you can actually see this little plaque here on this um, PowerPoint that talks about um, it a little bit. But it happened in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so the slaves' owners had suspicion of the uprising, and two slaves told their owner about the plans. He warned Virginia's governor, James Monroe, who called out the state militia. Gabriel escaped downriver to Norfolk. And <laughs> I said Norfolk, but if you are in Virginia, they actually pronounce it Norfolk. But he was spotted and betrayed there by another slave for the reward offered by that state. The slave did not receive the full reward, of course. Gabriel was returned to Richmond for questioning, but he did not submit. Gabriel, his two brothers, and 23 other slaves were hanged. So in 1811, there was another one. It was known as the German Coast Uprising. A group of slaves upriver from, from New Orleans seized cane, knives, and guns and marched on the city before militia could stop them. Some accounts claim a total of 200 to 500 slaves participated. During their two-day, 20-mile march, the men burned five plantation houses, three of them completely, several sugar houses, and crops. White men led by officials of the territory foreign militia companies and in the Battle of January 10, or 10th, killed 40 to 45 of the insurgents while suffering no fatalities themselves, then hunted down and killed several others without trial. Over the next two weeks, white planters and officials interrogated, tried, executed, and decapitated an additional 44 insurgents who had been captured. Executions were generally by hanging or firing squad. Heads were displayed on pikes to intimidate other slaves. Think Game of Thrones if you like, but that was a real thing. In 1822, Denmark Vesey, a former slave who had purchased his freedom, may have organized a plot to destroy Charleston, uh, South Carolina. I say may have because the evidence against him is disputed and comes from a trial that was not fair at all. But regardless, the end result of that trial was that he was executed, and as were 34 other slaves. All right, so this is um, definitely an important one called Nat Turner's Rebellion. 
it was probably the most successful slave rebellion, at least in the sense that they actually killed some people. Um, so Nat Turner's uh, rebellion took place in August of 1831. Turner was a preacher, and with a group of about 80 slaves, he marched from farm to farm in Southampton County, Virginia, killing the inhabitants, most of whom were women and children. And that's because the men were attending a religious revival meeting in North Carolina. Rebel slaves killed from 55 to 65 people, at least 51 being white. The rebellion was put down within a few days, but Turner survived in hiding for more than two months afterwards. The state executed 56 slaves accused of being part of the rebellion, and many non-participant slaves were punished in the frenzy. Approximately 120 slaves and free blacks were murdered by the militia and mobs in the area. The Nat Turner Rebellion struck terror into the hearts of whites all across the American South. Virginia's response was to make slavery worse, passing even harsher laws that forbade slaves from preaching and prohibited teaching them to read. Other slaves stated, uh, I'm sorry, other slave states followed Virginia's lead, and by 1830, slavery had grown, if anything, um, much, much worse. So this shows that large-scale armed resistance was not just suicidal, but also a threat to loved ones and really to all slaves. But it is hugely important to emphasize that slaves did really resist their oppression. Um, sometimes this meant taking up arms, but usually it meant more subtle forms of resistance, like intentional work slowdowns or sabotaging equipment or pretending not to understand instructions. And most importantly, in the face of the systematic legal and cultural degradation, they reaffirmed their humanity through family and through faith. Why is this so important? Because too often in America, we still talk about slaves as if they failed to rise up, when in fact, rising up would not have made life better for them or for their families. All right, and so we had a question which you aren't going to be able to answer um, because it's not live, but the answer is Richmond, Virginia. That is where Gabriel's rebellion took place. So if you thought about it in your head, very good. All right, so this was actually your homework assignment for last time, which is not what is um, your homework assignment this time. I'm going to pull that up here for you. Okay, let's put that down. Hi, I'm still here. All right, so your writing assignment uh, for this time uh, again, I recommend you read um, American Horizons, page 181 to 190. All right, I think I can actually. Sorry, my hand's in there. 181 to 190. All right, so that's what you're going to read. Uh, you're going to write 500 words in your response. Uh, a couple of you did not do that again this time, and I'm going to be taking off more and more points the more times that I'm seeing people not do that. So 500 plus words. All right. And the question is posted in Canvas, uh, and that is what new divisions did the French and Indian War create in North America? And why did some of those divisions result in the movement of thousands from or within North America? So, read up about it. If you do not find you get enough uh, information in those nine pages, then use the internet. Plenty of resources out there. Um, I'm, I don't expect a high level on this one, just simply because we haven't even talked about the French Revolution yet. We will get to it next time. Um, but I really don't want to make more than a 20 minute video. Uh, if you do have any specific questions that you don't understand from the reading, please email me. Um, this is going to be due on Thursday. If you are presenting on Thursday, uh, you will um, need to be sending me your lesson plan 
on Tuesday, so tomorrow for me, but today probably for you. Um, so make sure you do that. Um, and so we're going to have group two present on Tuesday, and we'll talk about the French and Indian War on um, the following Tuesday. So September 25th, we'll, we'll move that um, 